Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Tui Sutherland, who is a middle grade fantasy author. And uh, Tui, for, for readers unfamiliar with your work, could you please explain a little bit about what you write? Sure. Thanks, Selena. Thank you for having me. Um, I write lots of different things, but the thing I've been working on most for the last like 13 years is the Wings of Fire series. It is a series about dragons, where the dragons are the main characters. Um, they're the ones telling the story. They're the protagonists. They have all the fun. Um, and it is um, sort of structured in these five book arcs where, um, you know, you follow a set of characters uh, with a particular adventure for the first five books. And then there's sort of a new set of characters, although you still get to see the old ones for the next five and same again for the most recent five. So we're up to 15 books in that series. Um, this was number 15, which came out uh, a little while ago. And we're also doing like a graphic novel sort of um, companion to them where it's, we're making graphic novels of each of the books. And so the most recent of those is book six, um, which came out recently. And book seven, I think, is slated for December this year. Um, wow. So I've seen all the art. It looks really cool. <laughs> but yeah, so it's like big epic fantasy dragons having fun. <laughs> and um, the 15 is your last book, I believe. Well, I <laughs> most recent book, yes. It's not the last book in the series. Right, yeah, okay. Your most <laughs> recent book, yeah. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So um, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, um, I always try to write the kind of book that I would have loved to read as a kid. I loved dragons. I was a big Anne McCaffrey fan. Um, I loved all the books. Um, I try to make them um, sort of have the like all the things that I love. So like big fantasy, like uh, at high stakes, like you have to save the world. Like you're the one. It's uh, it's up to you. Um, but also funny. Like I really want the dragons to have a sense of humor. I want them to feel like um, your friends, you know, like when they're hanging out, their dialogue is hilarious. Um, and they're, you know, even when they're like very stressed because, you know, the world is at stake, they're still, um, they're still, they still have a sense of humor about it. Um, I hope that's something. Um, I don't, and then of course, dragons, there's a, a lot of kids um, who will pick up any book with a dragon on the cover. And I was one of those kids. So <laughs> I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> Right. Now, the person who who is doing your graphic novels, is is uh, that the same person who does your co your covers? No, um, that would have been amazing. But uh, she is the person who does the covers of the main series is Joy Ang. Um, and she's right. very busy, actually. She does a lot of picture books and other covers as well. She's uh, so talented and incredible. So she um, just didn't have time, I think, to do like an entire uh -huh which is very time intensive. Um, but the artist for these books is Mike Holmes. And he is also amazing. Like he can do all kinds of different styles. He also did the art for um, Secret Coders, the Jean Luen Yang series, um, oh, and like right. a thousand other things. He's just ridiculously talented. So we're very lucky. I feel so like blessed to have both of them like uh, working on these books at all. So. Oh, wonderful. That's yeah. great. <laughs> um, so what was the inspiration for the entire series? Was it because you were a, an Anne McCaffrey fan and you love dragons or what was the inspiration? Sure. It was partly that. It was definitely just loving dragons and wanting to write um, a series where uh, we got into the dragon's heads a bit more instead of um, telling it from the human's point of view. Um, but also as I was starting, so that was sort of the initial thing was like, let me write a series about dragons. Um, and then as I started working it out, the first five books um, are about a couple of things. There's a little bit um, about like fate versus free will. I was really interested in the idea of like, if you're in a prophecy, how do you react? And like, what is it, um, you know, do, do you feel it, like some of the dragons feel like this is great. Like my life is written for me. I don't have to worry about anything. And some of them feel like, hey, I want to make my own decisions. I don't want the world to tell me. I don't want a prophecy to tell me what to do. Um, it was a little bit inspired by the TV show Lost, um, mm -hmm. which ended around about like a, like shortly before I started the series. And I was really mad at the ending. <laughs> I felt like the ending was very like, there is no free will. And I was like, I do think there's free will, even if you're in a prophecy, you still get to decide like what you do with your life. So I was writing about that. Um, and the other main thing that happened as I was starting the series is um, I had my first kid um, who is 13 now, which is crazy um, and taller than me, which is unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> 
And um, and so I was thinking a lot about parenting too, because the five main dragons at the beginning of the series are taken away from their parents. They're sort of stolen from their families um, and raised by these guardians who believe that they're in this prophecy and are going to stop this giant war. So there's a lot of pressure on them. Um, and I was thinking about like, what do you, what are you born with versus like, what do you get like nature versus nurture? Um, and how do your, how does your surroundings affect you? So like they have the, they, you know, it seems terrible, but actually because they have each other, they turn into this like really great, like little group, um, that like support each other. That's like found family, I guess you could say. Um, and so, but like, what did they, what do they still have like from their original tribes and then their expectations, like, there are um, people who have or, or other dragons that have expectations for them, but they also have these like images in their heads of these like beautiful families they're going to find when they get to their homes. And that's not necessarily like what they discover as they get there. They, they each have sort of different realizations when they get back to their original tribes. Um, so I was just very interested in. I guess I was looking at my my kid um, and feeling like, whoa, he's he's perfect. <laughs> he's the best kid ever. Um, did I do that or did he come out that way? I think he came out that way. <laughs> I don't feel very responsible for it, but he's pretty awesome. They're both. I have two now. So um, but it was yeah, definitely something I was thinking about. I was like, maybe I'll write some really terrible dragon parents. And then at least I know I won't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start out your your series thinking it, it might be just one book and then it just grew or how did how did that work out? Um, for Wings of Fire, um, the plan was five books to start with, because um, I did know um, that it, there was going to be this prophecy about five little dragons. And so there would be one book for each of those dragons. Um and I'd written a few other things, like a bunch of other things before then, mostly either standalones or trilogies. Um, so this was sort of like trying to challenge myself to do a five book instead of a three book arc. Um, but I think it helps that it was a different main character for each one. So like they each felt felt like a little bit their own story to me. I mean, I think you have to read them all together. I don't you could just jump in at book four. <laughs> but um, but for me, it was like thinking about them in terms of like, as, as separate books. Um, but yeah, that was the plan was five books to start with. And then as I was starting book five, um, Scholastic started talking to me about maybe doing five more. Um, and so then it sort of expanded from there. Okay. So when you write, are, are you a pantser or a an outliner? I am a pantser. <laughs> Although I like the... Um, I like the gardener architect metaphor too. I think it was George R. R. Martin that I heard that from. Like in one of his interviews, he was talking about that. Um, where I don't, I can't plan too far ahead. Like I, um, I feel like if I know the ending, then I'll be telegraphing it all the way through, and it'll be less exciting right. both for me to write it and for the kids to read it. Like I sort of prefer to be surprised as I go, um, but like he talks about with gardeners and architects, I, I feel like I spend a lot of time like planting the seeds. So I spend a lot of time on the backstory, the history of the world, the history of each of their families. Like I'm really interested in the characters, like who they grew up with, like what their siblings were like, what their parents were like. So by the time I start the story, um, I have all this like detail in the back of my head about like where we came from. And so what happens next feels sort of natural. Um, I do usually have like a few big scenes like that I know I'm working towards. Um, you know, it depends on the book. Like, so for book eight, I did know the ending of that one. Um, and I was just working out how to get there. Um, for book one, I had like a, like a big middle scene that I knew was going to happen. I didn't know how it was going to end yet as I started writing it. Um, so, you know, I like to sort of, I like to figure it out as I go, because I feel like it's more fun for me as a writer. <laughs> It's a yeah, I, it would a whole be. Series. I will say like when you're writing, um, especially books six through 10, where I was like, okay, I know I'm writing five books. And in book six, there's a, a character who can see the future. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> 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 I have to include some scenes where she sees the future, but I don't know the future yet. So <laughs> she has a few <laughs> visions that are just really vague. And I was like, here's, I think I know what's, go what's happening here. We'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> So it would be really difficult for, for, say, somebody to pick one book in the middle of the series. And and it, it's not a like a standalone book at all. You'd have to understand what's going on. Yeah. Earlier. I think if you did want to jump in, like book six is kind of a new beginning and book 11 is kind of a new beginning, especially book 11, because it goes across the ocean to this other continent um, right. where, where like they, you know, there's yep. new 
dragons and there's a new history of the world. And so it feels like a new beginning. Um, but if you kept going by like book 14, it would it'd be all entangled with the other ones again. So um, I think it probably makes the most sense to start from the beginning. Um, there are a couple of sort of standalones in the series. There's um, these legends books that I've written. There's two of them. Um, mm -hmm. One is called Dragon Slayer and one is called Darkstalker. And I did write them to be like, if you just wanted to read one Wings of Fire book, you could read one of those. Um, Dragon Slayer is from the point of view of the humans. Um, and Darkstalker is a prequel that goes back like 2000 years to this, um, this sort of like ancient thing that happened that affected all the tribes going forward. And like it's it, it affects things that happen in books six through 10, especially. Um, but it is uh, it, you could read it on your own if you wanted to. Although I will say that's the darkest one. If you're like, oh, I just want to try out this fun dragon series, like Dark Soccer might give you a, a slightly wrong impression of the rest of the books. <laughs> that's the most YA out of all of them, for sure. So what made you decide to write for middle grade as opposed to like a, a an adult fantasy? Oh, sure. Um, I guess I've always been drawn to younger readers. And it's funny because I don't I don't think middle grade specifically as I'm writing, um, because I know that my audience, like based on the events, um, ranges from like seven to like 19. Like I get a, a huge range of kids showing up, mm -hmm. especially ones that have been reading it for a while. Uh, and I'm hoping that the books still appeal like across that age gap. Like, um, you know, there's like fun dragon adventures for the seven year olds, but there's like also some hopefully sort of deeper philosophical stuff for the older mm -hmm. ones to think about. And I know that there's a lot of shippers in the older um older categories too that that I, I relate to very much because I'm a huge shipper for like everything that I'm a fan of. <laughs> um, so um but I but definitely for these younger I've always been interested in writing for younger readers because I feel like they have um all this potential for um change and growth and I I'm really interested in sort of hopeful stories. Um and so I don't know. I love reading adult books, um, mm -hmm. but for what I wanted to write, I guess I, I thought about the books that affected me the most in my life. And they were books I read when I was a kid. Um, and I just feel like you can like actually affect change when you talk to kids. Like you can, you know, hope, like you can make, you can like give them that sense of like, oh, I could save the world. Like I could be this kind of dragon, you know, <laughs> I could be um, someone who who does something when there's so, when I see something wrong, I could be the person who stands up and tries to fix it. Um, and I feel like it's harder with adults. I mean, there are definitely adult books that make me feel that way, but um, just in terms of what I wanted to write, I was thinking about, um, you know, it's, it's fun to write for that younger audience and feel like both I'm combining like that, that sense of adventure that I love and like the, the possibility of like shaping their worldview, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, what kind of research went into writing this series? Um, it's funny because, you know, whenever I'm like, I did research for my dragon fantasy series, I get funny looks. <laughs> but um, I definitely was thinking about, um, I was trying to think of the dragons in sort of a, um, like biological sense, like what kinds of dragons would live in each of these habitats. Like I, that's how I divided up the tribes in the books. Mm -hmm. There's um, 10 tribes total. Um, and so for the first seven tribes, I was watching nature documentaries like Planet Earth, um, where I was thinking about, um, you know, what, you know, Planet Earth is actually divided into habitats for each of the episodes. And so I was like, what kind of dragon would live in this Arctic environment? And like, what, what could I take from the animals that do live there to give to my dragons? Or what kind of a dragon would live in the desert or a rainforest? And then for um, the books 11 through 15, where you meet the three new tribes, two of them are based on like insects. And so um, I watched a documentary called Life in the Undergrowth. And I took a lot of notes on um, like all the terrible things that insects do to each other. <laughs> it's like, they're kind of terrifying. Um, and so those gave me some cool ideas for like the powers the dragons might have and um, sort of their interactions. Um, those were, that was, that was super helpful um, thinking about them that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about um, your latest books? Sure. Um, well, let's see. So the most recent graphic novel is number six. It's um, based on the sixth book in the series. And this is one about um, a character named Moon, who actually has been um, separated from her tribe um, kind of like the first five dragons um, her whole life. And now she's 
like been brought to this school um, that's supposed to be like, you know, hopeful for like a, a peace after the war that ended in book five. Um, it's bringing all the tribes together. But she has a secret, which is that she's like the first dragon from her tribe in a long time who can both read minds and see the future. And so she is um, kind of she's really shy and constantly assaulted by like just thoughts like people's thoughts are always like you know in her head and it's very hard for her to focus um and I and so I um it's about sort of how she like grapples with that power um and like starts to see it as more of a gift than a curse like her mom has always seen it as a curse so she finds it hard she didn't realize that like, you could use it for good you know um and uh, sort of the dramatic things that happen in this like combination mm -hmm. of characters in this new school. And then book 15 is um, wrapping up the arc that started with book 11, um, which is like where you we met these characters on this other continent um, across the ocean. Um, so there's a new map at the beginning of these books. Um, there it is. That's the that's the second continent. And I when love the continents. I, that I love the map so much. I love the <laughs> map. This is incredible. Um, and so it's a, uh, in book 11, you got to meet them. There was a, there's like an oppressed tribe and there's sort of a, the like oppressor tribe. And then there's another tribe that they think is extinct, but I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a big spoiler to say they're not, they're just hiding. <laughs> and then, um, and it's sort of about that, like, um, trying to stop the the the, the worst tribe from uh, and particularly their queen um from uh there's like one of the things i got from the insect research is the way that um certain insects can like almost mind control others there's like um oh my gosh uh, like now I'm, I'm blanking on the names but the story is about wasps like laying their eggs in like caterpillars and then like having them like eating them from the inside out and <laughs> <laughs> or like ants like that can control each other like there's a queen ant that can like mind control all of her her like hive of ants something like that but so that was what I was saying I was like oh I've, I've got to do this like hive mind thing and so um queen Wasp can do that she can control all of her dragons um and and then there's a there's a bigger sort of secret story going on about like what's happening under the ground there and so book 15 is where um like our heroes try to come together and and sort of solve all the problems <laughs> that I set up in 11 through 14. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot going on there. That sounds great. So what can we expect from the, you in the future? Well, the next one in the Wings of Fire series is um, we're doing a guide to the whole world of dragons, um, which initially we were like, oh, we'll do it like a field guide and it'll be very like, um, you know, lists list like it'll be like oh here's some plants you can find in the mud kingdom um but i just i i don't have a very non-fictiony brain so as we started working on it i was like oh what if i did like a story from the history of the mud wings and then another story about this other mud wing and a story over and so it turned into a collection of stories <laughs> it's much more oh. um, much more fictional than a field guide sounds um it's but hopefully it answers a lot of questions that kids have um in terms of like uh, i i've had kids ask me at events like um who was married to queen scarlet like who would marry queen scarlet that sounds like a terrible idea <laughs> and, <laughs> in fact it was um you find out his whole story um in the book you know and it's it's designed to be like um one of our characters is trying to bring together sort of the stories of different tribes because there are certain tribes that have always sort of dominated the, the publishing industry of this world <laughs> where, um, you know, there's a lot of Nightwing scrolls and there's a lot of Seawing scrolls, but there aren't a lot from like the Mud Wings or the Ice Wings or the Sand Wings um, or certainly the Rain Wings. And so um, this dragon is trying to create a more sort of balanced view um, where you get to like tell like the true stories of each of these tribes um, through documents and like essays that the characters write so hopefully it's fun um and uh, it's got a lot of great art because we got joy to do a bunch of um like really cool art of a, like a queen for each of the tribes and then like little art all the way through it's really pretty so i'm very excited for kids to get their hands on that i think that's coming in october so oh so it, it really is not a non-fiction guide it's not just a so it's sort of <laughs> short stories yeah it's got it, it it's gonna feel hopefully a bit more like short stories although it's designed to look very very more like a guy like in each it's divided into chapters by like tribes so there's like the mud wings and then the sea wings and you get to go through and you know yeah hopefully it'll like answer some questions at least oh wow that's going to be interesting to to make sure that people know that it's not just a nonfiction guide 
It's, yeah. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> but it's stories. Uh -huh. So, yeah. okay. This question is, is kind of difficult. Which character did you love or hate the most when you were writing this series? It is hard. I feel like they're all my children and I, yep. like, I can't <laughs> pick one. <laughs> I guess um, I love writing sort of energetic, funny characters. Um, so someone like Kinkajou, who is a character that talks a lot, um, but also is really good for propelling the story forward. Like she's not a character that's like, oh, let's sit and, um, and, and, and mope about our problems. She's like, let's go fix things. And so <laughs> it like helps drag all the other characters like along. Um, Peril is a really fun character. She's the heroine of book eight um, because she's the uh, um, she. I call her my like sociopath with a heart of gold. She's um, <laughs> she's kind of a mess. She's had a terrible upbringing, um, and she can set things on fire just by touching them. So um, it's 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 not easy being peril. But her book eight is her sort of like journey to sort of um, try and be her own dragon. Um, so she's very funny and dangerous. Um, and nothing like me, uh, which made her really fun to write. Um, the characters that I hate the most are like, there's a few like really smug men. <laughs> there's one in Dragon Slayer um, that you meet near the beginning um, that, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I can picture certain specific smug men in my head as I'm writing them. And, <laughs> and so writing terrible things happening to them is, 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 also, is also fun, but I, I wouldn't want to hang out with them, that's for sure. Um, and I love all the like gentle dragons, like my, uh, I think that, you know, uh, Blue, um, who's in book 11, um, is of a piece with like Clay, who's in book one, or Sunny in book five, they're, they're like, um, they're sort of the, the dragons that it would be safe to hang out with, they wouldn't eat you. <laughs> well, that's good. Out, you know, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, a lot a lot of times authors put parts of themselves in their books. And, and did, did you find yourself putting your part of yourself in, in a lot of these characters? Oh, yeah, definitely. I feel like I can't wrap my head around a character until I found that thing that I connect with about them. Um, so sometimes it's pretty simple, like with Moon. Um, she's the new kid, right? She's um, at this school. And I moved a lot when I was a kid. So I'm, it's very relatable to me to be like, super nervous, like surrounded by people that I don't know and trying to fit in and not be awkward, you know? Um, so that was like, and she's a bookworm. Like that was easy. Like I got her. Um, someone with like Luna with a little harder, um, Luna, who's the heroine of book 15, um, because books 11 through 15, um, like 11 is my very like empathetic character. Uh, Blue is someone who is constantly thinking about other dragons. Um, like what's their experience? What are they feeling? Why are they like this? Um, and then book 13 is sort of his um, like not mirror character, but like, and not opposite either, but she's the resistance character. She's like, no, things are bad and we need to stop them. I don't want to understand the bad guys. I want to like fight the bad guys and make them stop doing bad things. And so she's like fierce and like, um, and uh, just, you know, ready to fight. Um, and so um, Luna in book 15 kind of had to bring those themes together. I was trying to find a character who is sort of naturally, um, she's not a fighter. Like she's, she's someone who, um, like loves everybody. <laughs> she's a, she's a, she's, a, but she also is very aware of the bad things and wants to stop them. So I guess there's a, a that was, that was how I figured it out. I was like, it's like me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I also want to understand people and stop the bad things at the same time. Like, how do I, how do I fit those two things together? So, um, with Luna, it's a lot about trying to figure out, um, a way to do that with art, right? Like she's not a writer, but she's an artist. She's a weaver. And she's like, is there a way that I can use art to make the world better? Um, like my way, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not Sundu's way. I'm not, or Peril's way. I'm not setting things on fire, but I, I can like maybe make the world better um, by showing people like a better way to be. So mm -hmm. that's, I think that's what I was trying to do anyway with Luna, with little pieces of me and, and her. Yep, that's good. That's good. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and putting out um, your, well, your latest book? Um, I think, let me think. Um, I mean, certainly with all of the Wings of Fire books, um, you know, there, there's usually, usually a point in book four, um, book four or 
or like the, the fourth book in the arc. So like book four, book nine and book 14, where I'm like, um, they're, they're the hardest ones because I can't solve all the problems until the fifth book in the arc, but I still want that character to do something important. Um, and so it's a matter of finding like something that, that they can do that will advance the story um, and feel significant for them, but leave a lot of problems for the last book in the arc. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, with the graphic novels, I guess I could say like one of the challenges of these is, um, is figuring out how to um, like fit all the story in basically like, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a person who loves when my characters talk a lot. And so, you know, I'm given these like tiny little bubbles where I have to fit in all their words. <laughs> and I have, a, um, there's actually an, uh, an author who, um, does the, he, he like goes through my novel and makes a manuscript, like a graphic novel manuscript for me. Um, his name is Barry Deutsch. And he, um, he wrote a trilogy called the Hereville um, graphic novels, which are wonderful. Actually, I highly recommend them. Um, so he's great. And he does a good job of like condensing the ideas into the bubbles. And I'm always trying to like stuff more words back in. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think it's, it is strange. Like I love seeing the the transition to like a more visual storytelling, but you know, for me, I love words. And so I'm like, but what about all their feelings? And Mike's like, I can do it here. I'll just put this one expression on Clay's face that conveys this entire page. And I'm like, oh, somehow he doesn't. <laughs> wow. That must be difficult. That's strange. I'm, I'm, very, I'm like, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky. I'm working with such great people. I think. <laughs> wow. All right. Now I have some questions about you um, as a person. What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Ah, that's a good question because um, I feel like I tell people most of the interesting things about me. Oh, I have a visitor. Here's um, uh, the babies. <laughs> that is... was one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you're here, she's like, uh, what's happening? Hi. This is, um, she's actually named after one of the dragons because uh, we got her a couple years ago um, and the kids uh, decided to call her Bumblebee. Um, uh, -huh. uh, so things, I mean, like, I think, you know, I'm an, I'm a big night owl. That's something, um, maybe people don't know, although I think I talk about it a lot. I do most of my writing between like midnight and 3 AM. That's like my favorite writing time. Um, I, I, I have a New Zealand connection. My mom's from New Zealand. Um, so my, my name is a kind of bird that only lives in New Zealand. Um, uh -huh. yeah. I think those are the, the interesting things about me, but probably people know them. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, I know that you, you do have a dog and I get, you have another one also. <laughs> yeah, she's sleeping. Another one is sitting there. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the best dog. So, um, so do, do your, do your um, dogs help or hinder you when you're working? <laughs> um, huh, good question. They, they help in the sense that I'm like, you know, especially when I'm writing in the middle of the night, I'm like, oh, I have company. They just sit here like with me. I don't feel totally alone, even though they're fast asleep. Um, but they do have a tendency to like know exactly when I'm about to start writing. And then that's when they show up and they're like, time for walks, time for going out, time for attention for me for some reason that like they'll be sleeping for hours. And when I finally like get my coffee, sit down at my desk, they're like, no, no, now, now is the time. Now is the time to get into us. They're really good. <laughs> You're very helpful. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, so they're probably about to start barking. I think one of my kids are going to come home soon just to warn, um, warn you. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your passions when you're, um, when you're not writing and how do you make time for the things that you love? Oh, well, um, I mean, my biggest other passion probably is reading. So it's um, not yep. too hard to fit that in. I'm, I'm, I just, I carry a book with me everywhere I go. Um, and, uh, and I'm just, um, you know, I read at night before I go to sleep. Um, I'm just constantly reading if I possibly can be. Um, and then I guess the other thing I do is hang out with my kids. <laughs> so um, I do have to like, now that they're both in school all day, that's very helpful because I can do some writing while they're at school and then I hang out with them like after school to bedtime and then I do my writing again after that. So, um, and uh, like they're big theater kids. So we do a lot of like going to theater, like talking about theater, rehearsing for things, auditioning for things. So <laughs> that's the other thing that's kind of um, constantly going on in our house. 
okay. So <laughs> when you're writing, um, do you prefer music or silence? Or silence. I can't. Um, I can't write with music. Unfortunately, I love. I love music, but um, I feel like I'm listening to the story in my head, like as I'm writing it. Like it's. Um, I, I've I've noticed this that like um, it's like I'm hearing it as I'm writing it sounds weird but so if there's anything else going on especially anything with lyrics then I can't I can't focus I can't hear it as well so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a work in silence write in silence person <laughs> and and what does your writing space look like it looks like this That's it. <laughs> full of dragons this is my I see dragons all over the place <laughs> <laughs> people are always giving me these adorable like um these like little dragons um oh. things like that or this is another one I love um, where they at, at events and I love putting them around the office to sort of like inspire me. Oh, look at these cutie pies. Um, I also have like art from the books like hanging up over my desk. Um, and then the shelves next to me, um, I have a shelf of uh, like writing books that I have loved because um, every once in a while I like to pick up a, one that I've already read and kind of go back to it. Um, I have two shelves of books that are just some of my favorite books that I've ever read. Um, and then a shelf of books that I'm planning to read. Um, so they're all, they're all sort of inspiration kind of next to me. Um, and it's just this little like office in my house um, where, where, where I try to escape to write, although everyone can find me here. So <laughs> it's not, not, we're not quite far enough from all the distractions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I have questions about being a writer. Um, what is your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and editing process? Sure. Um, I I love the sort of um, initial idea part. That's one of my favorite parts is, is like sitting and just brainstorming um, where I'm, I'm coming up with the characters and figuring out like what I'm connected to about each of them and like why I'm excited to write this book. Like what are the scenes I most want to write? Um, and like, how is the story going to connect? Like, um, whenever I'm working on like a mystery, for instance, like how does it all fit together? Um, I really love, um, that part, the sort of like idea stage. Um, and I actually like the revision stage, which is weird. <laughs> not, not everybody does, but I, I love when I finished the draft and I'm like, okay, now I can fix it. Now I can make it perfect. Um, I do a lot of revising as I write. Um, but, uh, but when I have a final draft, like a finished first draft and I can, I can start actually going through and like fixing all the rough parts. Um, I, I like that stage too. Hmm. Okay. Um, and what do you consider the most challenging part of the whole writing process, the writing and editing process? Yeah, um, there's usually a part in the middle where I where I'm not sure what to what to do, and I get stuck, and then I have to like kind of work through the writer's block um, to get to the next stage. Um, I think also the like um, the marketing side of it. I'm um, you know once the book is published, the the sort of um, like, I just want to be writing the next book, but you know, there's a lot of wanting me to go out and like promote the book and talk to people. And I love talking to kids. Like, I love that part. That's like, um, especially the ones who are like, I have my own ideas and I want to be a writer. And like, I love that. I think that's so great. Um, but the like getting dressed and leaving the house and making sure I have shoes on, like, <laughs> um, it's like not what I got into writing to do. You know, I, I, my plan was to stay home in my pajamas all the time. So like going out and promoting myself is, uh, is always like, I have to kind of like worry about it for three days beforehand and then like recover for three days afterwards. Um, so, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, you know, people want to talk to me about the books. So <laughs> It's all worth it. So what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Oh wow. I think it's that it's that talking to kids. It's the it's the um like meeting young creators because uh, they're not just writers. There's a lot of artists too who um who come to me with their like little dragons or their drawings or their ideas for a new dragon tribe or their like entire stories they've written. Um I think that for that's like the most rewarding part, you know, is, is getting, is realizing like that hopefully they're all feeling like I could play in this world. Like I'm welcome in this world. And I, I could be a creator too. Um, that's exactly how I want them to feel. Like I want them to feel empowered and I want them to feel like they can save the world. So, um, I think that's in terms of an adventure, 
um, that's what it feels like. Like every time I talk to those kids and I'm like, oh, they're so great. I have hope for the future. That really helps <laughs> talking to the, the Zoomers, I guess, the Gen Z kids. Like, I think that um, they're so great. They're so awesome. It makes me really hopeful. That is wonderful. <laughs> so what is the greatest lesson that you've learned um, thus far in your writing career? Oh, good question. I, I think patience is a big part of it, you know, um, and, um, and like, you know, uh, so, so I started off um, as an editor in publishing, well, as an editorial assistant, and I worked my way up to editor. Um, and so getting to see the other side of publishing and how long it takes and why it takes so long, um, like really helped. I think if I had started off just sending in a manuscript and then being like, why haven't they written back? Like I would, I, I you know, I was never a very patient person. So <laughs> getting to know the other side of it was really helpful. Um, and I think also like not getting too invested in reviews or comments or social media. Um, I, I, you know, I, I try not to read reviews, whether they're good or bad. I feel like they're not for me. They're for other readers to know whether this is the book for them. I, so I'm happy they're out there, but they're, they're, they were like all they would do for me is get inside my head and make me unable to write because <laughs> I would. I've constantly... heard that before. Yeah. Right about like mm -hmm. the one bad thing that I read today. So um, so I try really hard to to like you know to keep my writing space like sort of separate from all of that. Um, you know, I like my my brain is all either like the book the book I'm working on or like what's going on with my kids, and so yeah, I don't want to like fill it up with other voices. Um, because I, I'm, they should be out there talking to each other. That's a, I think that's great, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, it's not going to help me get my next book written. So what piece of advice would you want to give with other writers? Who would you want to share to other writers? Sure. I would say like, um, you know, keep, keep writing is, um, is one that I, I, I often say because, um, like, I think it's easy to, um, to write one book and then, or, well, it's not easy. <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean that it is, but I mean like, um, and then be like, this is the one book and just be circling that book, um, for years when, um, I think it's actually more helpful to send it out and start the next thing. Right. Like, I, um, hmm. I have, um, I have friends who I feel like have been very successful because like they, they were, they were able to start focusing on the next thing. Like they didn't see their writing career as like, this is the one book, but as like, I want to write like lots of books. And so I'm just going to keep going um, and not give up. Like that's such a big thing is, um, is the, you know, it's persistence, luck and talent. Um, and you can't do much about luck or talent, but you can, you can, you can do a lot about persistence, I guess. <laughs> just having faith in yourself, just like keep trying. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and also like keep remembering like why you love it. Like, I think that's another thing is like, you know, um, when you start looking at like, what are other people doing and like, what are they getting? And, um, you know, and, uh, and like, I, I think, I think just like focusing back on like, I love writing. Like, I just want to be writing. Like, that's the most important part of it. Um, and we're lucky because I think a lot of art, like you can't create by yourself. Um, you know, like if you're an actor, like my kids, um, like it's very, you can't really like act alone. <laughs> like you need a whole team. You need to be cast in something. Um, but what with writing, like I can just do it like on my own in my office. Like even if I'm, you know, for a long time I was writing before being published. Um, so, you know, remembering that, you know, we're, we're lucky that way. We should try to hang on to like what makes us happy about it. I think if that helps. Yep. Okay. Um, are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend to other writers that might have helped you in your career? Yeah, um, I um, was a part of the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators for a long time, and they like have these wonderful conferences where you can meet other writers and agents and go to panels and like listen to people talk about their writing. I think any opportunity to listen to other authors, um, like I love going to bookstore events or like zooming into them and watching other authors talk about their work. Um, I was in a writing group for a long time that I feel like made a huge difference to me. Um, it was run by an author named Karen Day, who is like one of the smartest, most thoughtful writers like I've ever like gotten to work with. And she was so great at like thinking about stories. She really helped me sort of um, change the way I thought about like themes and like, why am I writing this book? So finding a writing group where you can like 
um, with people you trust, you know, that's, I think, better than reviews and, and social media, because you it's people who are like really deeply thinking about your writing and hopefully giving you good, helpful comments about it. Um, you know, my sister is my first editor. Um, so she's someone also who I like really trust as a beta reader um, to help me like figure out how to fix a book. So <laughs> and she writes with you also. That's true. We've written books together. Yeah. We wrote the whole Menagerie trilogy together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I just have two more questions for you. Um, where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I have to give a plug for Annie's. Um, you can get Chewie's book at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613 or email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. Um, so, and where else could you people find your book? Um, well, I hopefully independent bookstores, that would be the first place. Um, and then, um, you know, online as well. I really like, um, are you signed up with bookshop.org? Uh, I am not sure. I don't do, I don't like, do things with the, yeah, they're like, the an, um, they're like an online alternative where the money goes back to the independent bookstores, um, instead of to giant sinister corporations. <laughs> <laughs> So they, I sort of discovered them in the last couple of years and uh, I might, I love ordering through them because um, if I want something and like you can pick the bookstore that you want the, the, the percentage to go to. So um, that's, that's, that's one that I use a lot too, but yeah, anywhere, hopefully, hopefully anywhere you can find books, libraries, they're also great. <laughs> okay. And my last question is how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Oh, well, um, I have a website. It's tuiebooks.com. Um, so T-U-I books.com. Um, and then I'm sort of on Instagram. <laughs> like I said, I'm very bad at social media. Um, <laughs> so every once in a while, I'll put something on there, but uh, I will often forget for months at a time that I have an Instagram. So, um, you know, and, and same, like, you know, it, it feels strange to have a place where like strangers can talk to me. <laughs> So I just don't go there very often, but I'm nominally on Instagram at Tui Sutherland. Um, and then, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Um, but in the books, that's, you know, I feel like I'm mostly in the books. That's, that's the best place to look for me. <laughs> okay. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, we will be seeing you at our bookstore sometime. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was great to speak with you, Chewy Sutherland. And, uh, thank you for thank your you questions. Those were awesome. This was really fun. <laughs> thank you very much.